Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Conquering Undruggable Targets to Obtain Preclinical Antibodies, presented by Integral Molecular. I'm Sharon Willis, co-founder and vice president of sales, and I will be moderating this webinar today. Just a few notes before we begin. You can access closed captions from the bottom right corner of the video player. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to watch on demand within 24 hours. We'd love to hear from you. During the presentation, please submit any questions you have using the questions and answers tab on the left side of your screen. Time permitting, we will conclude with a Q&A session. I will start off with an introduction to Integral Molecular and then hand off to our speakers. With over 20 years of experience, Integral Molecular's mission is to develop and apply innovative technologies that advance therapeutic discovery against difficult protein targets. We have deep knowledge of target biology and antibody discovery and engineering to deliver leads with a short path to IND. The success of our platform is based on keeping the antigen in its native conformation throughout the discovery process using mRNA and lipoparticles and immunizing chickens to access a broad range of conserved and challenging epitopes to produce diverse antibody panels. We have the capability to create final clinical formats and test the antibodies in in vitro and in vivo to position them 12 to 18 months to IND. Over the last 20 years, Integral Molecular has worked with over 500 companies, and we have many papers and patents, including publications in Cell, Science, and Nature. And now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Our first speaker is Marty Lair, co-founder and CEO of Context Therapeutics. Our second speaker is Joe Rucker, Vice President of Research and Development at Integral Molecular. And our third speaker is Ross Chambers, Vice President of Antibody Discovery at Integral Molecular. You can read their full bios on the left side of your window by selecting the Speakers tab. Marty and Joe will present case studies on two challenging targets, Claudin-6 and GPRC5D, with a focus on key innovations that led to the discovery of preclinical candidates being developed for oncology therapeutics. Ross will talk about how RNA immunization and chickens are revolutionizing antibody discovery. Okay, now let's begin. Marty, please go ahead. Hi, I'm excited to introduce Context Therapeutics. I'm Marty Lair, CEO of the company. Context is dedicated to advancing medicines for solid tumors. We have a really exciting lead program called CTIM76. It's a T cell engaging bispecific targeting Claudin 6 on cancer cells and has an anti CD3 arm to bind to and activate T cells with the goal of redirecting those T cells to cancer cells that express Claudin 6. Common cancers that express Claudin 6 include testicular, ovarian, non-small cell lung cancer, just to, to name a few. Overall, there's approximately 62,000 patients in the United States with metastatic Claudin-6 positive cancer. CTIM76 started its history actually at Integral Molecular. Integral developed a monoclonal antibody targeting Claudin-6. We were very fortunate to partner with the company in April of 2021 to work collaboratively on developing a bispecific derivative of that monoclonal. And I'm happy to report we developed a clinical candidate that is deep into IND enabling studies with the goal of submitting an IND filing with the FDA in Q1 of 2024. I've known the folks at Integral for almost a decade uh, at this point. Uh, I built a tremendous company, uh, real intellectual horsepower, uh, tremendous technical expertise, particularly with membrane-bound, hard-to-target proteins. Claudin-6 is a tetraspan protein. It's a classical hard-to-target protein. Uh, and that's really where uh, Integral uh, can flex their muscles and, and really use that intellectual horsepower. They've been a tremendous partner working with multiple individuals within their company who have supported the development effort, whether it's 
uh, basic biology, translational biology, biology, protein manufacturing, you name it. Uh, they've done a tremendous job for us and they continue uh, to be a great partner for our company. Cycling on to what is Claudin 6 and why does it matter? And why were we excited to partner with Integral on this effort? Well, Claudin 6 is one of those really exciting cancer targets because its expression is restricted to cancer cells. It's an oncofetal protein, meaning that it is required for the development of a fetus and then epigenetically suppressed in normal, otherwise healthy tissue. That's exemplified here in a slide from our corporate deck, highlighting the expression of Claudin 6 in cancer tissue on the left, taken from testicular ovarian and lung cancer biopsies. You can see Claudin 6 staining here in brown. On the right, you'll notice those images uh, across almost two dozen uh, different tissue types from normal healthy tissue are devoid or you see very, very low expression of Claudin 6. That selectivity expression is what really differentiates Claudin 6. As you all are aware, uh, when one develops a cancer drug, you inherently want it uh, to be a little toxic. Its goal is to kill cells, to kill the cancer cells. And those cancer cells often look like normal cells. And so to have something expressed just on the cancer cell to exploit with a technology like a bispecific antibody is what's really attractive about Claudin-6. As we think about further target validation, it's important to note that Claudin-6 has been shown to be prognostic across a range of tumor types. That's exemplified here with endometrial, bladder, and stomach cancer. You can note the line in red uh, denoting high Claudin-6 expression, meaning that the more Claudin-6 a tumor has, the worse prognosis for the patient. And therefore, targeting Claudin-6 may be a very tractable therapeutic strategy. As we think about challenges with Claudin-6, and this is really where integral flex their muscles. Uh, Claudin-6 is a tremendous target, but it's not without its challenges. Uh, Claudin-6 uh, is part of a broader family of proteins. Over two dozen of these proteins have been described. Over time, they have developed very, very specialized functions. And so while Claudin-6 is devoid of expression in normal tissue, Claudin-3, for example, is in the liver, Claudin-4 in the kidney and pancreas, and Claudin-9 in the ear. And so when we think about developing an antibody to Claudin-6, one has to pay very close attention to off-target binding to Claudin-3, 4, and 9. Because if one looks at the phylogenetic tree on the left, you'll note that Claudin-6 only recently diverged from Claudin-3, 4, and 9. And so genetic overlap between these targets is significant. And what Integral did in a real testament to their various technologies that they've developed in-house to discover antibodies and refine them is to thread the needle and find a uh, moiety within the epitope uh, that is extracellular expressed in Claudin-6 to develop an antibody against. And so to talk more about that discovery effort, I'll trans for over to my colleague, Dr. Joseph Rucker at Integral Molecular. Thank you, Marty. Um, and you know, it's been a real pleasure working with uh, uh, Context Therapeutics in developing uh, CTIM uh, 76. So, you know, let me just introduce the molecule, the, the our lead molecule, and then sort of tell you how we got there. What was the story that got us to this bi-specific and what were we thinking about as we put together this, this program? So the, the structure of, of Claudin-6, of the CTIM-76 is shown on, on this slide. It has humanized um, uh, Claudin-6 and CD3 binding domains, but it also has an FC domain, which uh, it, can extend the half-life of the molecule and allow for more uh, convenient dosing. Of course, we've silenced the FCO, FC domain uh, to reduce any um, effector function that could be associated with that, that domain. 
and um, C Tim seventy six um, has has excellent developability and has and has been um, you know has had a lot of um, ease in manufacturing and we've been able to manufacture it with high yields, high purity, and, and very very low aggregation. So it's a very very well behaved uh, behaved molecule. And what I want to do now is tell you how we got there and tell you about some of the properties of this molecule. So when you start a bi-specific program, and when we starting this bi-specific program, there were a number of considerations that came into mind, and and really members of our team and the and the context team, we put our heads together and said, okay, what did we what do we want? Well, we we knew we were gonna we we already had a a, a Claude and six targeting arm, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And the targeting arm had very very high selectivity for Claude and six over the other uh, Claudins, particularly Claudin 3, Claudin 4, and Claudin 9. But in addition to the Claudin 6 targeting arm, we of course wanted a CD3 um, engaging arm, and we wanted one that was clinically, va because of the novelty of the target, Claudin 6 target, we wanted a clinically validated CD3 arm that we could, could use, something with freedom to operate. And we also explored a, a range, you know, use CD3, a variety of CD3 arms, because we wanted to explore a range of, of potencies. Bispecific um, antibodies, you know, can be can be very very challenging, and it's not always clear what the format of the bispecifics to be. So we evaluated a, a variety of formats, in, including the traditional uh, small bite formats, an IgG-like format, and then even some more complicated uh, formats with different uh, stoichiometries of Claudin six and CD three binding arms. And then the final thing is when we were looking for the various arms that we were going to plug into the into the into the bispecific, of course we wanted to have reactivity to non-human primates um, to enable us to go into preclinical studies. And as mentioned previously, we we were um, preferring to have an, an FC um, arm that would allow for longer half life, but one that had a silence so that we wouldn't have to worry about um, you know typical antibody effector function. So let's first start uh, with the uh, Claudin six molecule. And when we, the Claudin-6 arm, we know when we were developing Claudin-6 antibodies at Integral Molecular, we know this issue of selectivity over the other Claudins was first and foremost in our mind. And we were lucky at Integral that we had a really good tool to make sure that our molecule wasn't going to bind um, bind anything other than Claudin-6. And that not only included other Claudin molecules, but other members of the human membrane proteome. In other words, we wanted an antibody that only hit those tumor cells and did not have any off-target reactivity outside of the tumor. We have a great tool in Integral for, for studying this called our membrane proteome array, which is 6,000 uh, human membrane proteins. We can interrogate antibodies using flow cytometry across the entire membrane proteome on live unfixed cells, um, live unfixed cells, and really get a comprehensive profile specificity across the entire membrane proteome. So when we first did Claudin-6 antibody discovery, we discovered a number of, of antibodies. And what I'm showing here is the structure of Claudin-6. Um, I'm highlighting in this case, the three residues that are on the extracellular domain of Claudin-6 that are different from Claudin-9, so it only differs by uh, three amino acids. And then what I'm doing is I am, uh, we're, what we're doing here is we ran uh, sort of four um, hits from our antibody discovery screen on our membrane proteome array. And what you can see here is actually a rather, um, um, you know, in, in general, all, of course, all the antibodies hit Claudin-6, but you can see that three of the antibodies hit some of the other Claudins, either Claudin-9, uh, Claudin-4, or, or Claudin-3. But one of these antibodies uh, denoted here as IM-171 was very, very clean on Claudin-6 and showed low or no binding to the other Claudins of interest. And this hit, IM-171, became the sort of the, the sort of the, the starting point for us developing a very high affinity 
highly selective um, um, Claudin-6 antibody that would then become part of CTIM-76. So um, after um, affinity engineering and selectivity engineering to get the best Claudin-6 arm, um, blessed Claudin-6 arm that we could, is we really actually decided to um, dig down into how, um, how was this antibody able to be so specific for Claudin-6 over other Claudins. So we did detailed mutagenesis studies using a, a platform at Integral Molecular known as shotgun mutagenesis to really show that, to really A, define the epitope of our Claudin-6 antibody. In other words, how did it, how did it interact with the uh, Claudin-6 uh, protein. And more importantly, we did more detailed studies to understand how a single residue in this case uh, could be the source of such a strong selectivity. So what you see in this slide on the left is the are those residues uh, that contribute uh, to uh, Claudin-6 uh, uh, Claudin-6, um, the Claudin-6 epitope, in other words, the binding of the antibody to Claudin-6. In red is the one residue that differs between Claudin-6 and Claudin-9 that seems to be driving this selectivity, which is glutamine-156. And we were able to um, um, show in a, in, in, a, in a paper that was published uh, in uh, 20, uh, just the last year, um, is that really a single uh, atomic um, interaction on this uh, residue uh, is really able to distinguish, enable um, our antibody to bind Claudin-6, but be unable to bind Claudin-9. So really we're able to dig down and understand that specificity. Um, in doing this epitope mapping, we were also able to compare our antibody to other antibodies uh, that are in early stage development, um, in, including in this case, um, IMAB-027, uh, which was uh, a, a molecule that was being developed by Estellas, and showed that our molecule, um, which in, in our paper is uh, denoted IM-301, but is really the Claudin-6 binding arm of, of CTIM-76, um, really has a very unique epitope uh, compared to um, competitor molecules. So it's, a very, it's very unique in how it interacts with its target. So, of course, once we had our Claudin-6 arms and we had a few Claudin-6 arms that we were interested in, we uh, paired those with a number of CD3 um, arms that had differing affinities and, and differing epitopes. We um, ended up with a, uh, a candidate panel of 54 antibodies, bispecific antibodies, that we uh, put through a range of in vitro studies, both binding and efficacy and developability, ended up with four lead candidates, of which um, CTIM76 was, our, uh, was, was, was our, our clear winner and is the molecule uh, that's gone, gone into um, gone into uh, um, um, development and is heading towards um, IND. So CTIM76 now as, it, as it's developed um, has a wide therapeutic window and I'll show you, um, I'll show you why. Um, it's fully humanized, it's got low immunogenicity and it's really had excellent developability and, and manufacturability. Um, it's been a very well-behaved, uh, lovely molecule to work on. So some nice properties of, of course, uh, bispecific. Of course, bispecific molecules work by bringing uh, effector T cells um, preferentially towards tumor cells and um, inducing specific uh, cell cytotoxicity here. So what you see on this slide is an in vitro studies of CTIM76 uh, CTIM on cells expressing Claudin-6. And you can see that it, 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 it's um, um, killing cells at, with picomolar, uh, picomolar potency. But then if you look at the, um, uh, look at the uh, um, cytotoxicity against the other Claudins, Claudin 9, Claudin 4, Claudin 3, it's several of other orders of magnitudes weaker, uh, weaker than, uh, um, uh, weaker than Claudin 6, showing that we should be able to get in vivo good killing of tumor cells expressing Claudin 6, but no, uh, a toxicity against healthy cells expressing the other Claudins. 
We've now, of course, put CTIM76 into quite a number of in vivo models. Um, so on the left here, this is our efficacy studies in a, in a uh, OV90 ovarian xenograft model in NSG mice with an engrafted human PBMCs. And what you can see is, you know, good tumor growth um, in animals where there's been a, uh, uh, that were treated with, uh, with a vehicle, uh, with, with the vehicle. So you see the, the tumor consistently growing, but upon treatment with uh, several different doses of, of CTIM-76, you get a complete regression uh, of the tumor in this, in this model. And this has now been done in, in, several, in several models. Um, this uh, CTIM-76, of course, now is also undergoing um, IND-enabling studies, including uh, studies in uh, non-human primates, uh, which are um, ongoing. What you see on the right here is the single-dose PK studies in non-human primates, and, and it's which is showing you know, linear pharmacokinetics and an extended serum half-life as expected. And, you know, even in these initial studies, we're really seeing no major um, cytokine release syndrome associated clinical symptoms or, or toxicity at the doses, uh, the relevant um, uh, doses that we would, um, that would, you know, help us uh, set um, our, our clinical trials up. So, you know, so far CTIM-76 is behaving itself uh, well in these um, IND studies. I want to just do a quick pivot right now to, uh, so that's um, our CTIM-76 program. And to reiterate what Marty said, um, this uh, program um, it has an expected IND of filing um, um, at the end of uh, Q1 uh, in 2024. So I just wanna quickly pivot to another bi-specific program that we're working on, which is the uh, GPCR, GPRC5D. This is a, a G protein coupled receptor, which are always very, very challenging targets. Um, GPRC5D is a very interesting uh, target. It's expressed in multiple myeloma cells, but it's not expressed in healthy tissues except for uh, uh, hair follicles. And it has a, um, it, it, it makes it a, this clean expression profile means that it has um, a good potential um, with a therapeutic modality in immunotherapy, in other words, bispecifics. In, in bispecifics. So we did a, a, a very uh, deep uh, campaign for antibody discovery against uh, GPRC5D. And we were able to isolate a number, uh, quite a number of, of GPRC5D specific antibodies. We built these immediately into a bispecific uh, so we could um, analyze these molecules in the context of the modality that we were most interested in. On the left, it shows the uh, binding of these of, of close to 50 antibodies against GPRC5D. And you could see that there's a real wide range of affinities. Many of these antibodies were highly cross-reactive across a diverse orthologs, um, both um, primate as well as uh, rodent orthologs for GPRC5D, helping to streamline uh, preclinical studies. But what was interesting is then when we put these into bispecific killing assays, we found that only there were only some unique, very, very unique binders that had really strong cytotoxicity in, this bi, in these bispecific formats. And those are the molecules that we have now moved forward um, for uh, doing more detailed types of in vitro testing. So um, what we see here on, the, on this slide is really are the sort of the lead candidate molecules uh, for our GPRC5D uh, bispecifics. These show uh, picomolar cell killing in um, multiple, uh, in many and several different multiple myeloma cell lines, including ones that have high GPRC5D expression, as well as ones that are lower in the GPRC5D expression on the right. Um, we have a number of different molecules, um, different uh, molecules and, and formats that all show very, very potent, um, uh, potent um, killing cytotoxicity. Um, and right now we have one lead candidate, which we're uh, beginning to um, do, do more, de more detailed uh, studies on. As I said, these m molecules have very, very high potency um, for uh, killing a multiple myeloma cells. Of course, we have um, full intellectual property rights over all of these molecules. And we are in the, in the process of starting uh, the in vivo um, uh, murine uh, efficacy studies on these molecules. 
But I want to say one more thing about GPRC5D before I hand off to my colleague Ross Chambers, and that is, uh, and that is, of course, um, you know, very recently there were some uh, studies that were uh, uh, performed uh, by J and J, where they took bi specifics against uh, uh, BCMA. Uh, BCMA, which is a multiple myeloma target, as well as a bi-specific that was against GPRC5D, um, similar to what we're developing here, and showed that in clinical styles, uh, clinical trials, a combination of those two therapeutics showed um, unexpectedly high um, um, uh, response rates. And so we were interested in the possibility of combining the, all of those targets into a single molecule. And we are um, have you know beginning to um, some of those in vitro data are beginning to become available. I just wanted to show a, a sneak peek here, um, where we have a molecule, a tri-specific molecule against GPRC5D, BCMA, and CD3, um, CD3. And what you see on the right is the specific cytotoxicity of this molecule shown in red, as compared to a, a, a similar a bi-specific molecule uh, that's shown in blue. And over the next few months, uh, we're really, um, um, you know, we're, we're uh, um, di di digging down into sort of the in vitro characterization of these molecules uh, with then um, being uh, the, uh, then uh, setting up uh, in vivo's efficacy studies to um, study these in, in even more detail. Um, so um, integral molecular has a uh, diverse uh, pipeline of, of antibodies against a number of complex membrane proteins um, um, shown here. Of course, you know, some of them um, have been um, our, our partnered programs, including our, our CTIM76 program with Context, as well as uh, several other partnered programs. We're actively working on our GPRC5D program that I just uh, saw, as well as other programs in oncology, autoimmune diseases, as well as pain. But in order to go against any of these types of challenging targets, you need a very specific type of discovery platform. And at this stage, I want to hand it off to my colleague, Ross Chambers, who's our VP of Antibody Discovery, uh, to uh, talk about our um, antibody uh, discovery engine at Integral Molecular. Great, thank you, Joe. Uh, yes, so uh, what I'm gonna tell you about now is the discovery engine that's behind these uh, clinical molecules that we just heard about. So uh, multi-pass membrane proteins are very difficult using traditional approaches. And the reason is because they have very really multiple challenges that hold them back from making uh, antibodies against them. Uh, as shown in this slide here, there's a couple I wanna, uh, these problems I want to highlight in particular, which is many of these proteins are highly conserved, meaning that they're difficult to make antibodies in animals. And two, that their structure is dependent on the membrane, which means they're very fragile and that you have to keep them in the membrane at all times to maintain their native conformation. And these are some of the problems as well as other ones that we have solved with this platform. So first up, talking about highly conserved proteins. So if you look in the middle uh, graph, if you look at all human drug targets and you compare their identity to mice, almost half of them are very highly conserved. But if you look at on the left, uh, the proportion of antibody drug candidates that are against highly conserved proteins, it's much smaller, only 14% of current uh, antibody, clinical antibodies are highly conserved. And this represents the challenge of being able to make antibodies against highly conserved proteins. The root cause of this, of course, is that we uh, are heavily reliant on mice for generating antibodies. This is, stems from the fact that monoclonal antibody technology started in mice with the hybridoma technology. But since then, a number of technologies have been created, such as phage display and B-cell cloning, that have enabled us to expand discovery into other animals. And this trend has been growing in recent years. And in fact, our clinical candidates have been entering the clinic from a number of other species, including chicken, rabbit, and camelids. 
So as I mentioned before, uh, over almost half of all human drug targets are highly conserved to mice. So an obvious solution is to go to another animal. However, if you look at, on the right at the evolutionary tree, jumping to another common animal such as rabbit or llama doesn't really solve the problem. The root cause is that mammals in general as a group are all very similar. So really to overcome this high conservation problem, you have to go to a more distant and related species. And that species that we have been using is chicken, which has a much greater evolutionary distance from mammals. And you can see this here, if you take a look at that same panel of drug targets, uh, where half of them are highly conserved to mice, it's only 15% of them are in fact highly conserved in chicken. So really chickens enable, uh, really solves this problem largely of how they generate antibodies to highly conserved targets. And that's shown here, here's some examples of four highly conserved targets to mice uh, in the high 90% identity between human and mice, uh, all multi-span membrane proteins, but the identity in chicken is significantly lower, usually 10 to 15% lower than mice. And when we immunize these targets into chickens, you see that all of them are able to reliably induce high titer antibody responses to these targets. One other uh, side benefit of this is that since mammals are all closely related, uh, what we often find is that chicken-derived antibodies can cross-react across multiple mammalian species. And this, of course, is very useful for doing preclinical studies where you'll be using the molecules in mice and, and, and primates to study uh, the, the molecules. Um, and when they don't cross-react, you may have to make surrogate antibodies and, and things like that to solve this problem. But here, with chicken-derived antibodies, what we have found is that we often find that the antibodies are able to cross-react with mice as well as sino um, spe uh, species. And in fact, this has been seen across the field. So we are not the only ones using chickens for antibody discovery. A number of other groups are using chickens. And in fact, this is a list of uh, a number of, um, of uh, preclinical assets uh, targeting various proteins and in fact, almost all of them uh, are able to cross-react with, uh, with rodents. Now, um, since we are generating antibodies from chickens, we need to think about humanizing them since they'll be going into people. And uh, it turns out actually that chicken humanization is very easy since chickens use just a single antibody framework and it's a well-behaved framework. And so you can humanize chicken antibodies using the classic CDR uh, grafting method. However, uh, we developed a few years ago uh, uh, an even better method, which we call HCAT, which means we uh, humanize millions of antibodies in parallel before we do antibody discovery. So after immunizing chickens, we will isolate just the CDRs from the antibodies and clone them into a fully human framework. Uh, this framework that we use is 100% identical to uh, frameworks in FDA-approved antibodies and have well-behaved de uh, well developability. And what that means is we end up with a fully humanized library that we can then use for discovery and means that the hits that come out of these libraries are already humanized and don't require any downstream engineering. An additional benefit that we've observed is that the CDR shuffling that occurs naturally in this process does mimic the process that occurs in chickens. And what we find is that we get additional affinity maturation of the ant antibodies, giving us, you know, picomolar affinities of these candidates. So that's uh, dealing with uh, highly conserved antigens. Uh, the other issue that I pointed out was that you must maintain native epitopes of these very fragile proteins. They depend the membra on the membrane for the structure. And so you really have to keep these proteins in the membrane at all times to, to ensure that we get antibodies that work on the native protein. So we have two technologies that we use in combination together to solve this problem. One is lipoparticles. 
These are virus-like particles that contain high concentrations of the membrane protein in a membrane. The second technology is nucleic acid immunization, either DNA, but more recently we've shifted to RNA, where we immunize the animal with nucleic acid and the protein is made, the antigen is made in the animal in vivo, in the membrane, in its natural environment. Uh, for those that don't, uh, haven't heard about life particles, this is one of the founding technologies of our company. Vi uh, life particles are virus-like particles that we create by uh, co-transfecting into a cell that's highly expressing the target with a viral core protein. This results in budding off of the plasma membrane with high concentrations of the target protein to create these small particles that we can then purify and concentrate. And these are uh, have been excellent reagents both for immunizing animals as well as for uh, panning phage libraries to pull out the hits. Uh, so here are some examples of immunizing chickens with this platform using RNA and life particles. Uh, and the first example is an easy example. It's the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein that almost everyone has made antibodies to by now. It's well expressed, it's foreign, it's easy to do. You can see here that we got five out of five strong high titer responses using this platform. Second example is a very difficult GPCR that we'd worked on that was very challenging uh, even for, our, uh, um, for, for, for many, many uh, attempts. It's got very poor expression and it's very highly conserved even, even to chickens. But here with RNA and life particles, we got four out of five high titer responses. And then the last example is a, is a very difficult ion channel. It has very poor expression. It's highly conserved and very small extracellular loops. And again, we got very high titer responses in the majority of animals. Um, one of the antibodies that we have developed over the years uh, was to a protein called uh, SLC2A4. This is the, the GLUT4, uh, uh, the glucose uh, transporter. And when we screened the, this, uh, this library and pulled out hits to this protein, this multipass protein, it's a 12 TM protein. One of the unusual things we discovered was that we pulled out an antibody we called LM48 that was able to bind to the glucose transporter in a state-specific manner. So this protein uh, exists in multiple conformations as it cycles through the glucose transport cycle, starting with uh, the uh, outward open where it binds glucose and then it flips into the inward open. And what we found is that we had an antibody LM48 that was able to selectively bind to the outward open state. And one of the interesting properties of this antibody is that it has a very long uh, CDR H3, it has 26 amino acids. And as has been shown in the literature with many camel antibodies that also have these long CDRs, is that they're often very useful for binding into pockets. And in fact, this antibody appears to bind in a, in a cavity in this outward open state. Now, um, this, this is a, a, a well-known property of, of longer CDRs. And in fact, um, if you look across um, a number of antibodies, you'll find that antibodies with uh, you know, very short CDR3s form this concave structure as shown here with nivolumumab. And if you have a, a moderate size CDR11 uh, amino acids, which is pretty typical for a mouse antibody, you typically get flat paratopes shown here with cetuximab. But with these longer CDR3s, you get these protruding paratopes that are able to bind into pockets shown here with irinumab which binds the GPCR CGRPR. Uh, and it was a key property of this, of this antibody with this long CDR to bind into this cavity to give it the specificity that needed to, to bind the target. Now, uh, I'm telling this because uh, we didn't, didn't get lucky with finding this unusual antibody to GLUT4 with this long CDR. In fact, chickens have longer HCDR3s like camelids have. So here in this graph, you can see the distribution of CDR3 links across all clinical antibodies. And you typically see an average of 10 amino acid links. And this reflects the fact that most of these antibodies have come from mice that typically have short CDRs. 
However, if you look at the distribution of CDR links for chicken antibodies it's shown in orange, you see that they're significantly right shifted. In fact, the majority of the antibodies actually have, are predicted to have protruding structures that are able to bind into these pockets. And just show some examples here. So uh, there's a chicken antibody in the clinic against PD-1. That is a 17 amino acid CDR. The Claudin-6 uh, CTIM-76 molecule we just heard about has an 18 to 20 amino acid CDR3 length. And then, of course, the LM48 that against uh, glucose transporter has a 26 amino acid, which is even quite rare for chickens as it's really quite out there on the, on the spectrum. Okay, so that's uh, the, our uh, brief overview of our platform. Uh, what we've shown you is that you can take on these very challenging multi-pass membrane proteins requires a number of technologies. What we're using here is technologies to maintain the native structure of these multi-pass membrane proteins using DNA and RNA immunization with light particles. Chickens have been a key technology to enable us to solve highly conserved proteins, as well as the longer CDRs to reach into unusual uh, pockets in, um, in proteins. So thanks for your attention. <laughs> All right, thank you to our speakers. Now let's move on to the Q&A. As a reminder, please submit your questions using the Q&A tab to the left of your screen. We have lots of great questions already and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Our first question is for Ross. Are chicken-derived antibodies more immunogenic than those derived from other mammalian species? If so, are there any solutions to reduce immunogenicity? Yeah, thanks, Sharon. Yeah, that's a um, good question. So um, there have been uh, only one antibody in the clinic from chicken-derived sources. And in that example, there don't, don't appear to be any ADA issues with that. Now, um, in terms of, in general solutions, with chicken humanization, because of the ease of it, we're able to achieve very high levels of humanization. In fact, the frameworks don't contain any back mutations. So that means that essentially it's just the CDRs that are different. And of course, all CDRs across antibodies are different. And so even fully human antibodies can have ADA problems. Another issue, of course, is uh, a well-behaved antibody that doesn't have any aggregation or developability issues because those things can also drive immunogenicity. So having high degree of human frameworks, as well as a well-behaved antibody, I think a key to keeping immunogenicity at bay. A follow-up question to that, Ross, is are there any chicken-derived antibodies in clinical trials? Yes, uh, Synphagen was the first to enter the clinic with a chicken-derived antibody, uh, SIM21. It's a PD-1 antibody. And um, that's a very interesting antibody because they were able to get uh, an antibody that was not only high affinity, like 30 picomolar, but able to cross-react with sino and mice, even though that it's not a very highly conserved protein. Uh, and that's one of the reasons they went to chickens. Great, thank you. All right, the next question is for you, Joe. In the GPRC5D case, do you know why some binders were cytotoxic and others were not? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, at the moment, we don't know. Um, but that's, it's almost certainly going to be due to the antibodies hitting different um, epitopes on GPRC5D. And we're in the process, you know, a process of doing some epitope mapping to make those, you know, to, to make those assessments. Just, sort of on a, just to sort of broaden that question a little bit, in many cases, you know, we find that the, the geometry of the bispecifics actually makes a huge difference about whether you're getting any any killing or not and we've had examples and multiple examples across you know multiple types of multiple programs where you can have two binder arms that you know a cd3 arm and a and a target arm that bind perfectly well but in some formats show cytotoxicity and other formats do not show cytotoxicity so really these you know the epitope matters and the and the format matters okay 
And kind of a follow-up to that one, Joe, how does off-target binding relate to off-target cytotoxicity, um, maybe for, for CTIM76 and other bispecific molecules? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question, and, it, and, it's, and it's, it's been an, an interesting one. So, you know, for cytotoxicity, for the way these uh, CD3 engager molecules work, you really only need a probably a relatively small number of molecules to be engaged with both the target and the T cells in order to get, get killing. And what that means and on a practical level is that you could have antibodies that show very, very low binding to an off-target in, in once again, in a binding assay, for example, flow cytometry, but in a cytotoxicity assay, which is much more sensitive, you, you can actually begin to see um, cytotoxicity in that case. And, you know, then that's, you know, a, you know to, to sort of give a little bit more details on that, you know, even for Claude and six, you know, the binding affinities that we get are just sub nanomolar or on the sub nanomolar level, but the, the, the potency of the antibodies are a couple of orders of magnitude um, stronger than that. So there's a, a big there's a big discrepancy there between where you see your binding and where you see your cytotox. Great, thank you. The next question is for Marty. What differentiates CTIM76 from competing Claudin6 approaches? Well, obviously the work we did with Integral is a start. Um, but in, in a, a more practical sense, um, the selectivity that we were able to achieve with the integral platform for Claudin 6 and the concerning off targets being 3, 4, and 9 are really dramatically different than the competitors, particularly as it relates to Claudin 3 and 4. That will have practical applications and impact in the clinic as 3 and 4 are enriched in the liver and the pancreas. And using a T cell engaging by specific, uh, as Joe mentioned, is a very potent modality. And so you can see T cell scaffolding uh, with these therapeutics. And so off target activity, even in, in vitro, if it's moderate, can have a significant clinical impact. And so we've been very fortunate to partner with you all in developing an antibody and the T cell construct that. Uh, has the ideal characteristics, performance characteristics relating to that selectivity profile. Great. And a follow-up to that, Marty, will CTIM76 enter the clinic as a monotherapy or more likely in combination? Yeah, we haven't provided formal guidance as to what the phase one trial will look like. I can say, compared to similarly situated companies that recently entered the clinic with T-cell engagers, uh, we do aspire to have monotherapy activity. That would be absolutely our goal. Uh, I think over time, there's some intriguing work around how to enhance T cell persistence, but we feel confident that we have a highly active molecule with an appropriate safety profile to support potential monotherapy use, not just in, in the short term, but ultimately over the long term. Great. All right, the next question is for Ross. What is Integral's efficiency in recovering binders from the chicken immunizations? Yeah, that's uh, quite high. Uh, in fact, it's very straightforward to make libraries from chickens because it's a single framework. So the efficiency of building large libraries is, is, is easy. And then panning them, uh, we use light particles uh, that I mentioned in, uh, just previously and light particles have very high concentrations of the target, which is really critical for phage panning. And using you know, light particles, it really rapidly enriches the target antibodies out of those libraries. We often, after just two rounds of panning, we're able to have high levels of hits that we could screen efficiently. Great, thank you. And um, another question came in, Ross, just to clarify, are there, are there any chicken antibodies on the market yet? No, no chicken antibodies in the market, but plenty hitting that way. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see. The next question, hold on one second, is for, um, for Joe. Uh, what's, what is the advantage of a tri-specific over a bi-specific antibody? Yeah, it's a good question. In, in, the, case of, uh, in the case of GPRC5D, you know, well, I think that the tri-specifics in, in, in the case of GPRC5D is 
the the J and J results where they did a combination of the two bispecifics against the two antigens was really gave unprecedented uh, response levels and something like ninety five percent ninety five percent response rates. And the idea about a tri-specific is that could give you um, um, an ease of dosing. And I think in general for multiple myeloma, there's always, uh, you know, you, you have these several different antigens that you can go after, BCMA as, as well as GPRC5D. And what having a single molecule that can go after both of those antigens, particularly in something like multiple myeloma, which can be heterogeneous, is going to give advantages in terms of that in terms of that response rate. And actually to just jump and answer another question on here that directly um, follows from that is that um, we haven't uh, assessed yet with our tri, the tri-specific program is at a much earlier stage than c 76 but we haven't assessed what happens upon the loss of activity upon downregulation of each of the targets. But that's something that we're um, currently, um, uh, currently setting up to work on. Great, thank you. Um, all right, and then another question from Marty. How well do you think that a bispecific antibody will penetrate a solid tumor? So the, the nice thing about a bispecific antibody uh, is it doesn't have to penetrate the, the tumor. It has to localize a T cell to the tumor. And so there's always concern about the extracellular matrix and what that can do as far as preventing access to tumor. Um, tumors are big. There's a lot of surface area. Uh, and I think what we've been able to show in others is that there's ample room for a T cell to get there. And the more direct uh, evidence relating to that for Claudin-6 is that a competing product from BioNTech, a CAR-T approach, has produced absolutely outstanding data thus far in cystic or in ovarian cancer, thus showing that a T cell can absolutely traffic to a tumor uh, and produce the intended therapeutic effect. All right. Great, thank you. All right, uh, back to you, Ross. What is the species cross-reactivity that you typically see in an immunization campaign? Yeah, um, what we normally see is that if a target is um, greater than ninety percent identical with the um, between the between the the, tar the two species, we almost always get a cross-reactive antibody. Greater than eighty percent. Uh, almost always we find one, but a little bit more searching. And then you can always find them down at 60% identity. You can find them, but that takes a bit more searching. But we generally have very high success rate at finding those species cross-reactive antibodies. And kind of following up on, on the chicken theme, um, what were the main challenges in cloning the chicken CDR regions into the human antibody? Um, the main challenges for us were we wanted to do it in mass. We didn't want to do it one by one. So we developed this method using um, type 2 restriction enzymes that enabled us to piece together the CDRs into human frameworks very efficiently to make very large libraries that could uh, be, to be panned. Great. Thank you. Um, all right, Joe, are there any downsides to try specifics? I mean, you know, once again, I mean, to try, you know, the bispecifics, you know, I think over the last few years, you know, bispecifics now, you know, you're beginning to get a number of approvals coming through and we're seeing the advantages for for bispecifics in terms of tri specifics. It's, it's still early, early days, um, early days. You know, I think where I think the advantage could be on advantages are, are on the potency side and the ease of dosing side. One of the disadvantages, at least compared as we're talking about the, you know, you know, comparison with dosing, for example, with two bispecifics is, you know, you have less control of the dosing of one arm versus the, the versus the other. The ratio of the dosings of the of the two arms is always going to be is always going to be uh, set in stone. So I think a lot of it's going to come down to, you know, when you get into the clinic, what the, the dosings are. And, and of course, I mean, let's, let's, let's say, you know, as you go from, you know, monospecific antibodies to bispecifics to tri-specifics, there, there are always complexities as you get to a more complex type of modality, a more complex type of, of a complex type of um, uh, structure. Uh, but, you know, these, you know, these challenges have been met for bi-specifics and I'm sure they'll be met for tri-specifics as well. 
And following up on that a little bit, is there you know a specific structure that you find to be the most effective for a bispecific molecule or a tri-specific molecule? No, I mean it's been it's been an, it's, it's been an interesting process. We've tried lots of different geometries, and and really I think for each pair of binders um, of binder arms, you really want to. You don't want to second guess yourself. You know, biology is always smarter than you are. And so, you know, we took an agnostic approach and tried a number of different scaffolds, a number of different arms. And really that's that's the way to that's that's the way to do it. Do we have preferences, you know, for, for some arms in terms of, you know, in, in terms of, you know, ease of doing, you know, constructing them? Yeah, yeah, there, there's some, but really that's not a major driver. It's really you know, screening across multiple formats, multiple ARBs to find that what works the best um, for your given um, for your given set of molecules. Great, thank you. Um, another question that came in, I think Marty or Joe, you could answer this: Could bispecific antibodies cross the blood-brain barrier for solid tumor targeting? Uh, I'll answer. I'll answer this one, and yeah. Marty can jump in. Um, so, you know. If you have a intact blood brain barrier, you know, a bispecific antibody, unless you put in some sort of arm to enable it to transverse, is probably going to stay out of the brain. But we do know that in a lot of different disease states, you begin to get breakdown of the, the blood brain barrier. And in those cases, it's going to get across just like any other, like any other antibody would. So our antibody has nothing on it that would ease that process. But you know, presumably in in the types of uh, types of uh, patients we would be um, targeting, there would be some possibility of that of that um, of it crossing the blood brain barrier. Yeah. All right, um, Ross, you talked about many different technologies that are part of your antibody discovery process at Integral. Um, are any of the technologies that you mentioned you know available for use outside of the discovery platform, like lipoparticles, specificity yeah. profiling? Yeah, yes. Um, yeah, so lipoparticles are a fee-for-service product um, that we that we sell. It's one of our founding technologies of the company, and we sell uh, lipoparticles to many, many customers. And um, other technologies, I think Joe mentioned the membrane proteome array, that's also Fee for service, and if you want the specificity of your antibodies tested, uh, that's available um, to everyone as well. Great, and that was our last question. Um, we had a lot of great questions. We couldn't get to them all today, but we'll we'll follow up individually with any questions that we didn't answer. Um, I want to thank you for attending this fierce webinar presented by Integral Molecular. And I'd also like to thank our three speakers for participating today. A recorded version of this webinar will be available for you to access within 24 hours using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Thank you again for joining and we look forward to seeing you at future events.